should be not be um, uh, addressed. For one could argue that the psyche might be uh, specifically the very link of the subject with the social. So the, the psyche can be said to be um, always already political. However, what we should reject is the claims um, of the neural discourses and people like uh, Malabu that the neurology would be equipped to provide the scientific naturalized link between the uh, psychical and the political. We should not leave uh, that what one could call a uh, parallax, parallax gap between the psychical and political spheres. Uh, we should not leave this to the neuroscientists and the psychologists. All this poses a question it defines to psychoanalysis. And as, the, as I hope to demonstrate, it is precisely when one fails to address adequately the question of how to be a materialist today that the terms of psychology, psychoanalysis, neurosciences and politics that they threaten to collapse into each other and making uh, any kind of critique or emancipatory uh, project impossible. The critical issue for psychoanalysis, then, is not to claim to be able to offer, in Johnston's words, a rich, sophisticated meta-psychological theory, usable for uh, the other terms in the square, but rather to make explicit the very impossibility of such a multi-employable meta-psychology. Now, is it not there, in this gap, in this very structural impossibility, that we should attempt to develop a truly materialist account. Now, in this respect, I, I, I agree with Johnston that, it, um, that presently psychoanalysis is solicited concerning its claim to be a materialist theory. For Johnston, psychoanalysis uh, should renounce any anti-naturalist materialism. So um, for him, a materialism entirely divorced from the natural sciences would be a, a materialist only in name. But the crucial question uh, concerns what you offer as an alternative to um, the divorce between the uh, between psychoanalysis and the natural sciences. Should we, in this respect, not put a wager on the very impossibility? Uh, of this uh, liaison and um, put there the, the what Lacan said il n'y a, uh, a pas de relation sexuelle um, there is no uh, sexual relation would we not have to repeat it there is also no relation between psychoanalysis and the neurosciences now um, I would like to in this respect argue that um, what psychoanalysis has to offer is something else, something different, a decentered materialism. Now, Johnston um, would see the reconciliation between psychoanalysis and the neuroscience as a dialectical process. Um, to which I would like to oppose a, a, the specific which is, in my opinion, then, uh, the specific specificity of a psychoanalytic approach to materiality, which I call, then, uh, decentered materialism. That is not the materiality of the convulsion flesh, but the materiality of the real, and more specifically, the materiality of the Lacanian object A. So the very fact that this constitutes a fundamental breach with psychology and the newer sciences uh, remains unaddressed in Johnston analysis. Um, I'm going to skip a part and directly try to move up to um, what is actually the, the materiality of psychoanalysis. Um, starting with the idea that um, if anything what psychoanalysis has valued is um, 
is trying to see a, um, a truth in the illusion, a truth in the symptomatic, um, a truth in the unconscious, and ha hence maybe a materiality um, within these illusions and these fantasies themselves. Uh, Lacan, for example, contends, the subject mistakes itself, and this concerns the real appearance, so Lacan continues, is not our enemy, it points to the real. So does this not mean that the materialism psychoanalysis concerns a materiality of the lure and uh, a materiality of appearances? Consider, for example, how Lacan, in respect of this real, mocked scientists who reduced sexual attraction to a uh, hormone called albumin or other chemical uh, substances. So along the lines of Freud's glance on the nose, uh, Lacan, for example, evokes the devin, the down, on the forearm of a woman. And he says that, uh, then, something which could induce a shiver right through another person faced with this pure manifestation of her existence. So this in turn leads Lacan to say that sexual attraction is about bringing the lure into play. Um, the lure, he says, it's, is its very reality. So at the very least, we are here on a totally different uh, track um, than the materiality of the convulsing uh, flesh. For psychoanalysis, the as if stands not only function as if it is real, resulting in some kind of performative reality, but, as also, for example, Slava Zizek puts it, um, the, as if, the as if is the thing itself. It has an actuality on its own. So this means that the idea of the free will, for example, is not merely a performative marriage, but rather, because of its illusory status, has a massively operative and hence material weight. One can note here uh, how psychoanalysis already connects with a certain tradition of, of uh, ideology critique. Consider, for example, how a Marxist approach involves not an analysis of subjective illusions, but of objective illusions. That is, illusions with, which grant our reality in the facts. Marx concluded that if one tries to unearth uh, social realities such as money, for example, by stripping them of their mystifying veils, one does not end up eventually with the hard materiality itself, but again with, as he, call, as he calls it, the metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. So the illusions of social reality, such as money as religion, and, and religion, therefore are objective illusions. Now, at the cross-section of, uh, of the psychical and the political, therefore, a decentered materialism sees light. Through this elaboration of the psychoanalytic notion of the subject of the leg, Zizek, for example, could help us to relate this Decent materialism to the Lacanian object A. Ah. Is not Lacan's uh, basic materialist position that the lack itself has to be sustained by a minimum of material left over, by a contingent, uh, indivisible remainder which has no positive ontological consistency, consistency but is simply a void um, embodied? Does not the subject needs, uh, need a irreducible pathological supplement? This is perhaps what the formula of the fantasy, the uh, divided subject coupled with the object, indicates. For psychoanalysis, the subject is the subject of the lack, that is, the subject is never fully equal to itself. It's only constituted discursively via a signifier representing the subject for another signifier. So it might be that at the very site of this discursive void that the subject is related to, what, uh, to that which in uh, the phantasmatic uh, scene 
uh, embodies or materializes it like the object A as the object cause of desire. Um, and here one could um, refer to um, the example that Zizek often gives is the, uh, when he points to the old uh, Catholic strategy to guard men uh, against the temptation of the flesh, um, then um, it was often said by the priest that they, that, uh, to the men that they should think of um, how the body of, of the woman would look in a couple of decades, to imagine what lurks now already beneath the skin, raw flesh and bones, inner fluids, half-digested foods and excrements. Now, what Zizek then argues that is that far from enacting a return to the real, destined to break the imaginary spell of the body, that such a procedure equals the escape from the real itself, that is the real, announcing itself in the seductive appearance of the naked body. So for Zizek, the decaying body is a reality, as opposed to the spectral appearance of the sexualized body of the woman, written then with the capital, which is actually the real at stake in psychoanalysis. So psychoanalysis, I would claim, in the light of the neurological turn, uh, cannot but pose it, uh, its materialistic, decentered view, and hence, uh, I would claim, should defend its uselessness, qua uselessness. Um, I guess I'm asking whether, I mean, there's a certain kind of politics to uh, to the sort of what you're calling the mainstream, right? Psychology and, and language of psychology, and descriptions of psychology, when those are brought into, or when those are interacting with always, interacting with neuroscience, right? When neuroscience draws on those concepts to then map them onto these images of the brain. Um, what I'm asking is that, is that is, is there a different sort of politics of neuropsychoanalysis? Meaning, when Mark and all those people are trying to say that that psychoanalysis has, a, has, a, has another language or another form of description, but as you're pointing out, that's then supposed to be in the service of neuroscience. Does that produce any the same sort of political disconnect that you think the mainstream psychology do, does? Or, or is there differences to be brought out between them? Now, to begin with, uh, um, the, argument, the argument that I, that, that I make is when um, psychoanalysis uh, think they can put uh, psychoanalytic theory into the service of, uh, of neurosciences, that then they found, find themselves on the other side and become psychologists. Uh, so that is the, uh, and then they are caught in the, in, in the same dynamics of uh, the mainstream 
side sides. But um, if your question is then to, to connect it then to the broader uh, biopolitical uh, uh, scheme, um, that would be, uh, I think, a huge um, question in the sense of the, the team would then be how is neuropsychology and neurosciences in, involved in, in, in today's biopolitics. And, and then, well, um, you should look into how, I think, above all, at least it is my major interest is to, to how look how in, in, in it, it enters into education, uh, the neurosciences, um, which is, um, I think a, a, a primary uh, domain, I think, where first psychology came in at a, at a given point in, in history, uh, which is a few decades ago, I, I should, say, should say that it, it seems to be that um, psychology, uh, that to educate people uh, seem to be, um, it, 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 it reached a kind of uh, deadlock education at that time, and psychology was, you could say, evoked um, to, to get it going again. That is one of the, if, if, um, in my work on psychologization, it's one of the recurrent themes I see that psychology comes in when uh, there is something, uh, a, a discourse runs into a deadlock, and, and psychology is then evoked to, uh, to, to get things going, and, which is, I think, in my personal uh, experience, I saw uh, first psychology come into my education via uh, the religion uh, classes. In, in the sense that I think that uh, that is I'm speaking now of the 70s, 80s. Uh, at that time, the uh, I think the uh, priest giving those classes were um, well saying that the youth was changing and that they could not give. Uh, Bible study and catechismus like they used to do. So, and then they, they started to do psychological things. We had to speak about ourselves, uh, and, uh, about relations and, and things like that. Um, and, and then I think this slowly getting of psychology into the curriculum um, generalized. And I think you can say that the same, for the same reason, there was like, you couldn't, uh, educate people with um, a uh, stress on knowledge and on discipline like you did in, in the 50s and the 60s. So the, uh, education came, uh, encountered a deadlock and psychology was uh, uh, evoked to, to get it going then. So, and then of course the, the idea is, um, then you had a psychological discourse which um, not only centered on disorders, but also on, on capabilities, on uh, skills, on resilience, and things like that. Uh, and then if you then uh, put that uh, alongside the discourses which were um, uh, present in the uh, economic spheres, which uh, needed no longer people with a, uh, a limited knowledge, but needed, uh, above all people who were skilled, uh, had a uh, versatile and things like that. So you see that the, the same um, discourses which were used in the um, uh, entrepreneurial spheres were actually the same in, in psychological things. Uh, and um, I guess that the um, neuroscientific discourse as I enter uh, Education are still to be looked upon in the same vein. So maybe um, I'm intrigued by this materiality, psychoanalytic materiality. I wonder if you could, the example of the shiver on the skin, the 
down on the skin. I didn't quite follow it. It ended up with a critique of hormones, and I wanted to hear that space or, or kind of where, like where in Lacan is that, and can you elaborate it more? Because this going from a shiver to the as if, I, wa I want to hear more how those two things are connected. Because I, I think that's really intriguing. It's like the necessity of the subject in something like tickling. Maybe, I don't know. Just throw okay, it. Um, but now we're <laughs> most interestingly shifting the focus on which uh, starts with Freud's glance on the nose. I don't know if you're familiar with that. that is, uh, yeah, maybe we can start there because I don't know that. Um, but it's. it's in the back of my mind, it's one of the uh, it's a Dora study, or uh, one of the early hysterical uh, patients of Freud, um, which is then centered ar ar around the, the specific uh, scene of the glands on the nose, and he. If I recount it well, it's it's uh, he uh, Freud already also plays on the signifier, on, uh, on the, but I should have looked it up before I used the example. Today. But uh, but actually, then uh, Lacan uh, um, adds or his own example is then the the uh, the duvet. I don't know if it's an English word. The, the, the little hairs on the, the forearm of a woman. Um, I don't know if it's uh, his own example or something, but he said that uh, that uh, can be enough to, to run a shiver to uh, a man's body. Um, so, um, of course, um, you can say, well, you end up with the bodily in the end. Because the first op option was, was of course, to, to put to the, to the uh, specific uh, imma material materiality of the glands on the nose or the duvet on the, the forearm of the, uh, of the woman. psychoanalysis, psychology, and neurosciences, because those are three sort of terms that you seem to go between. Um, and I was wondering, because you were talking a lot at the beginning about method, cure, and theory, and I was wondering, has, like, yes, psychoanalysis was initially perhaps all three of those things, but I know that now there are several different avenues of mental study, neuroscience, psychiatry, and also psychology. Um, is psychoanalysis actually even still practiced as a method and a cure, or is it really only a theory nowadays that then gets taken up differently by those different medicinal discourses? Mm -hmm. So, like, I don't know if you could maybe see how you actually see those terms working or the differences between them, because I wasn't quite certain. Well, to begin with, historically, you could say that uh, from one to two to devise psychology he's turned his uh, attempts to, to to ground the scientific psychology even and, and that was um, his time that he was uh, engaging with uh, biological and neurobiology of his time so initially these terms uh, you could say the psychoanalysis uh, what Freud was doing uh, Corporate to three uh, disciplines, mm -hmm. but in the end, you could say that um, psychoanalysis uh, became a new 
thing in, in the sense also that uh, well Lacan says that it, 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 uh, Freud invented the unconscious and hence invented also a specific discourse, the psychoanalytic discourse, which is um, something different from psychology, something different from the, the neurosciences. And you could, um, certainly within Lacan's writing, there is a lot of um, critique on psychology. You could say that uh, um, Lacan was actually an anti-psychologist very strong current uh, within Lacanian uh, theory. Um, and your question um, about the practice, I, I think, yeah, well, there are so many forms of psychoanalysis as there are psychoanalysis. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the idea that I said that uh, it has nothing to do with psychology, there will be uh, people who will not agree, there were people who could do stuff um, on neuropsychoanalysis, but of course neuropsychoanalysis is, is um, if you read people who are working with it, um, it is actually a theoretical endeavor and not really a uh, clinical endeavor in the sense that I think that anybody, everybody almost agrees on the fact that with neuropsychoanalysis the cure wouldn't change. It's not um, because you know the, uh, some kind of uh, symptomatology of some kind of uh, psychological, psychic mechanism is situated in some kind of part of the brain that it would actually uh, change uh, the cure. So in, in the sense this is again the uselessness uh, of seemingly of, of, of the neuroscience for, for psychoanalysis itself. Um, so, somewhere in this, I uh, can't quite remember at which point, but you, you wrote this third term of the, um, natural. Not really ideological or material exactly. Um, what you were talking about that you know psychoanalysis should not succumb to the sort of like anti-naturalism. Yeah, I'm so, oh, <coughs> sort of wondering um, if you can articulate that with respect to um, to this. Uh, as if the materiality is the, the as if, like, um, where do you see that in terms of uh, being articulated alongside the, you know, the, the sort of naturalist approaches or antithetical to it or uh, parallel to it? Um. But actually, the, the idea that uh, psychoanalysis should not be anti-naturalist is uh, actually what Johnston is promoting. And uh, I would myself not be, be putting it, uh, it in these terms, um, in the sense that um, what is nature? Um, it, is, um, it makes me think also um, um, a bit tedious discussion uh, in, in, in psychology uh, centered around the nature-nurture di dis discussion uh, in, in the sense that um, if, if it used to be that for nature uh, versus nurture, the nurture was then the mother, uh, which wasn't uh, really uh, elaborated. That, that's actually was the idea to, to understand that it would be the mother at the place of nature. But that today we would say the mother is, is replaced by the experts. So today it's the founding uh, dichotomy would be not nature versus nurture, but nature versus expertise. In the sense that um, behind the mother there is the, the psychologist or the the self-help book saying how you should, you should uh, raise your uh, 
child, and then nature becomes something which you can trick, you can lure the trick. So if your child is uh, not behaving, so positive reinforcement is, uh, is like the magic trick, which then can uh, seemingly uh, have an effect on nature itself. And, and maybe today, with the neuroscience, this, the, 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 the opposition would be uh, nature versus the brain, because uh, you look at how, for example, um, uh, I read something recently on, on gender dysphoria, uh, which is then uh, the idea uh, in the DSM that, um, so your brain actually is female and your body is, uh, is male. Uh, so you have now the opposition be seemingly between the nature your body and then the brain, uh, which is what is it that, that something not natural, not bodily. So um, I think, yeah, to to say uh, that we should be naturalists, uh, naturalists is well. If you then ask what is nature, then the discussion only begins. thinking about um, how that relationship might be different depending on the type of neuroscience that you're talking about. So what we seem to be talking about more was about imaging and thinking about the brain, but like in some of my work I come across this other type of neuroscience that talks more about the, the chemistry of the brain, for example. Right? And so I'm wondering how, is there a difference in the way that mainstream psychology ends up getting mapped onto neuroscience um, depending on what that neuroscience actually is. Yep, but I agree that uh, the neuroscience are not a monolithic uh, thing. But, uh, they have different strands within them and also different techniques and some indeed focus on, on imaging and other not, um, but there might be um, two things that I would answer to that, and first is that um, I, in my critique on, on neuroscience and, and, and things like that, I depart from, mostly from, um, in general, how neuroscience come into culture and popular culture. And, uh, and I do know that that is not um, standing for the whole of the neurosciences, but I would claim that um, in those uh, translations, in those expropriations perhaps of real neurosciences, um, there is something uh, hegemonious um, um, in, in those, if you look at, at, at uh, these phenomena, and I would claim that um, or I would at least ask myself, is, is the, the, the problems, the paradoxes which arise in that field, um, are they perhaps not symptomatic for the whole field? So that is the hypothesis and, and the thing to, to, uh, well, to, to analyze it. In the sense that uh, is is this uh, so uh, uh, the word that I engage with so but but I'm I'm, I'm willing to, to uh, discuss this and in the sense that if if the is uh, if this is the case or not if this if what uh, is visible in culture and, and in education for example 
if uh, that is actually uh, showing the basic problems or not. Of, uh, the um, and on the other hand, I'm willing also to go a pretty long way to, to argue that um, uh, at some point psychology has to come in in the human sciences. And that is a, well, that's the critical and problematic point, so, uh, which um, isn't, um, in my opinion, is, uh, there's no solution for that point too, because um, I would claim that psychology is an impossible science um, and hasn't dealt with it. And, and, and so the, the problem will return at, at that critical point with that, which I pointed out. Then also with the idea that psychoanalysis is not the, the one who is going to, to solve the problem, also for structural reasons. Thank you so much for coming.